So we were looking at this example in my number theory class the other day, and it was so nice that I thought I'd make a video to share it with everyone. It starts with the notion of a Fermat number, which we will denote by F sub n. And those are numbers of the form two to the two to the n plus one. And it'll end with another proof that there are infinitely many primes using these Fermat numbers. So the first thing that we want to do is prove the following claim, which is some sort of recursion involving these Fermat numbers. And that is f sub n plus 1 is the same thing as this product, f0, f1, all the way up to fn plus 2. Okay, so how could we prove this? Well, I think the most standard way to, would be to prove it by induction, which means we need to start with a base case. So maybe my base case would be the n equals zero case. That would maybe be the easiest thing. And now let's notice that that leaves us with f sub one on this side because that's f sub zero plus one. But notice that f sub one is equal to two to the two to the one plus one, but that's clearly equal to five. But now let's look at f sub zero plus two, which would be the right hand side of this base case. Notice we don't have a product. Well, maybe we've got a product of one term, just f sub zero. So that's gonna be equal to two to the two to the zero plus one plus two. Okay, but notice that's two to the one, which is just two. So we have two plus two plus one, which is five. So indeed, we have equality for this base case. Okay, so let's make an induction hypothesis. So our induction hypothesis will be that for some k bigger than or equal to zero, we have this statement is true for that spot. So we've got f sub k plus one is equal to f sub zero up to f sub k plus two. And then we want to consider the next case. So let's do that. So I'll just say, let's consider f sub zero all the way up to f sub k times f sub k plus one plus two. Now let's apply the induction hypothesis to this bit right here. Okay, so if we apply the induction hypothesis to that, then rewriting this a little bit, we'll see that we have f sub k plus one minus two times f sub k plus one plus two. Okay, so just to reiterate, I got that by inverting this equation. So notice that obviously is the same thing as this product f zero up to f k is equal to f k plus one minus two. And that's the useful way of looking at it here in these yellow parentheses. Okay, so now let's see what that leaves us with. We'll have f sub k plus one squared minus two times f sub k plus one, and then finally plus Two. And now we could actually plug in the definition for f sub k plus one here, but I think there's a little bit of a trick we can do. Let's take this plus two and replace it with one plus one. And then we can group this together in these red parentheses and notice that that's a square of a binomial. That's in fact equal to f k plus one minus one quantity squared. And then we've got this plus one on the outside. Now we can finish it off with the definition of fk plus one. So notice fk plus one will be two to the two to the k plus one, and then we subtract one, so that's gonna cancel out. We need to square that and then add one. But now this is a bit tricky because we've got this complex exponent here, but we can still just use exponent rules if we're careful. So notice all of this is in the exponent of two, and then we're raising that whole object to the second power. But then our exponent rules say that we multiply exponents. So that means we can bring this inside if we multiply. But then we think about that as two to the one, 
and multiplying that those exponents inside, we'll just add the exponents. So that'll leave us with two to the k plus two plus one, which is exactly equal to f k plus two which was what we needed to show to finish off this proof by induction. Okay, so let's get rid of this proof and then we'll work towards using the Fermat numbers to show there are infinitely many primes. So we just got done proving this multiplicative recursion on the Fermat numbers. So that was Fn plus one is this product, F zero up to Fn plus two. And now we're gonna use that to show that any two non-equal Fermat numbers are relatively prime. So in other words, for all m bigger than n, the GCD of Fm, Fn is equal to one where I just took this m to be bigger than n to make the proof work out nicely. That's not super important. What we would really need is just m not equal to n. Okay, so let's maybe see how this proof goes. So let's start off by noticing that since m is bigger than n, we know that n is less than or equal to m minus one. Then we'll apply this multiplicative recursion to f sub m. So I'll maybe write that as follows. Let's notice that f sub m can be rewritten as f0, f1. All the way up, we'll have fn somewhere in the middle, and then we will end with fm minus 1. Now perhaps we end with fn because these are equal, but probably it's just somewhere in the middle. And then finally we have this plus two. Okay, great. Now I'm gonna introduce a little bit of notation. So let's go ahead and set x equal to the following product. So it'll be equal to f0, f1, all the way up to fm minus one over fn. So in other words, this object right here is equal to fn times x. Now let's see what we can do with that equation. We can rewrite that equation as fm minus fn times x equals 2. But now let's recall that for any integers a, b, and u, v, so I'll just write that as this, a, b, u, v integers, we know that the GCD of a, b divides the object a, u plus b, v. So that's a pretty standard result. But what does that mean? So that applied to this equation tells us that the GCD of fm, fn must divide two. But two is prime, so that tells us that this GCD of fm, fn equals one or two. But now we know it's impossible for this GCD to equal two because all of these numbers are odd. So that means we can eliminate that possibility and we end with this GCD being equal to one. Okay, so now we'll get rid of this proof and finally use this claim to prove the infinitude of primes. Okay, so as promised, we're gonna use these Fermat numbers. In fact, we'll mostly use the fact that they are relatively prime to prove that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And now how can we do that? Well, let's do it like this. So let's say for all natural numbers in, let's set PN equal to some prime, and really it can be any prime number, such that Pn divides Fn. So it's a prime divisor of the nth Fermat number. Okay, well, how do we know that there is such a prime divisor? Well, that's easy by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Every number factors into primes. So perhaps this is prime on its own, and then pn would be equal to fn. But it's, if it's not prime, it factors into primes. And we just take one of those primes and set it equal to p sub n. And now I wanna define the following function. So let's define our new function, which I'll call g. So it comes from natural numbers to the set of all prime numbers. 
And what does it do? Well, it takes g of n and sets it equal to p sub n. Okay. And then I'll finish all of this off by showing that g is actually an injective function. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, let's maybe go ahead and suppose that g of m equals g of n, but that means that p sub m equals p sub n, but that means that p sub m divides f sub m and p sub m divides f sub n. But then we have got a prime number that's a common divisor of f sub m and f sub n. But that's impossible because we know their GCD is equal to one unless these are in fact the same number. So we have f sub m is equal to f sub n, which tells us that m is equal to n. But that's exactly what we need for this function to be injective. So now we can easily finish it off from there. Injectivity tells us that the cardinality of the natural numbers is less than or equal to the cardinality of the set of all prime numbers. But the natural numbers clearly has infinitely many elements, but that means the set of prime numbers also contains infinitely many elements. And that finishes the proof of this theorem. And that's a good place to stop.